In this Elden Ring video, I'm gonna be showing you my Dragon Warrior build. This is a level 150 version of the Blood Dragon build, which is sort of an extension of the Dragon Knight build, but it's different because it goes back to using the dual curved sword setup that we had in the Blood Dragon build. And while this build does use dragon spells effectively, we have sort of changed up the way that we use them. And I will be doing a separate video that focuses only on using dragon spells. But this one is sort of a mashup between using a dual curved sword warrior and using some dragon spells. So let's talk about the weapons we use for this build. What you want ideally is two bandits curved swords. That's because they have the highest damage of the curved swords that you can use for this setup. And you're going to set the bleed affinity on both of them anyway. I'm actually using one scavenger's curved sword here because I couldn't be bothered to farm a second one. But since you're sitting the bleeding affinity on both of these weapons, it doesn't really matter much. Like the scavenger's curved sword, if you're using some other affinity, would, you know, outperform these. But since we're really going for that bleed buildup as fast as possible, using the bleed affinity is the best way to do that. So it doesn't really matter if you have bleeding on your curved sword natively or not, which is why we use the bandit's curved sword. We're also using the Dragon Communion Seal here. No surprise, this scales very well with Arcane. We're going to have a lot of Arcane with this build in order to increase our blood loss buildup in order to set the Hemorrhage status effect as quickly as possible. And, you know, you're going to be able to get a lot of damage out of your Dragon spells with this because of the high Arcane and also because this uh, seal boosts Dragon damage for Dragon Communion spells. So you're going to get that increased damage as well. For the helmet for this build, I'm using the White Mask. This further increases your attack power by 10% when you set Blood Loss on an enemy. This is going to be constantly with this build. So you're going to basically have that plus 10% all the time. And for other armor, you basically want to use very, very heavy armor for this setup. Not only to give you more protection, but also to give you more poise. That way you don't get interrupted a lot when you're attacking. You can shrug off some regular attacks. And also when you're using some of the Dragon Attacks, you'll be less likely to be interrupted while you're casting them. So the talismans that I'm using are the Primal Glenstone Blade, the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, Winged Sword Insignia, and Millicent's Prosthesis. Primal Glenstone Blade reduces the FP cost of spells by 25% in exchange for 15% of your max HP. We have very high HP with this build, so that's not an issue, and you have very good protection so you don't die easily. And Dragon spells cost a shit ton of FP, so reducing that by 25% is substantial. This is going to be between 10 to 15 FP in most cases, and if you hold the button down, it's going to be even more than that. This allows you to get away with a lower mind stat and still increase all the other stats that you need to increase in order to get good damage and survivability out of this build, while still being able to use these spells all the time. The next talisman we use is Lords of Blood's Exaltation. This increases our attack power by 20% when we've set Hemorrhage on ourselves or other enemies. Again, this is going to be all the time. And one thing I want to mention too is that because we're using Seppuku on both of our curved swords, you're going to be able to set this on yourself regularly. So even if like you're going into a fight and you haven't set bleeding or maybe the enemy is immune to bleeding, you're going to be able to set it on yourself like right at the beginning of the battle, giving you that attack power increase between this and White Mask of 30%, which is great. Wing Sword Insignia is there to increase your attack power as you repeatedly strike enemies. Because you're dual wielding with curved swords, this is going to be quite frequently. Again, the running L1 and jumping L1 both hit four times almost instantaneously when they go off. This allows you to build up this buff really, really quickly and get a lot of attack power increase. And the same is true for Millicent's Prosthesis. The upside to this one is that it also gives you plus 5 dexterity, which is great as well, for further boosting your damage. When it comes to spells for this build, I am using Golden Vow to further boost all of our damage and protection. This includes spells and attacks. I'm using Blessing's Boon to give me a heal over time. If you're using Seppuku, you're damaging yourself. So you want to be able to heal that up. And also this will just heal you up regularly throughout fights, which is good. I have the Egg Sykes Decay spell. This sets the Scarlet Rot status effect on enemies as well as deal physical damage to them. This is really good. We have a huge focus on physical damage in this build, which is why I selected this spell. The other two spells we use for this build are Dragon Claw and Dragon Maw. Both of these deal physical damage. And Dragon Claw does less damage than Dragon Maw does in general, but you can spam it two times in a row. So it's better for, you know, weaker enemies that you don't need as much damage for that'll save you FP. And it's also better at staggering enemies like bosses and things like that because of the repeated strikes. Dragon Maw does more damage, costs more FP, is slower to cast, has worse tracking. So it's better on bigger, slower enemies that have huge health pools. So you're going to kind of alternate between these. You can use other dragon spells as well, but the way I have this build set up, you're going to be primarily using these two, and I'll explain why in just a second. So the general strategy for this build is that when I'm running around the landscape or just going through a regular dungeon or something, 
I don't typically buff up much. I will put Golden Vow on and then maybe use one Seppuku on my main hand. I won't even do both. Generally speaking, one running L1 will be enough to kill just about anything that can be bled. And keep in mind, when you do a running L1, the animation starts a bit early before the blades actually hit. So do the attack a little bit early as you kind of close the gap to the enemy so that the swords will connect when you get into melee range. I will use Blessing's Boon if I'm in like a highly, you know, trafficked enemy area and I know I'm probably going to take some hits. Whereas if the enemies are more spread out, then I'm not worrying about that as much and I won't cast it. Exile's Decay is a really good AoE for situations where maybe you need to clear an entire room or there are a lot of enemies that are like really close together or maybe you want to just set Scarlet Rot on a difficult enemy from far away before it gets to you. These are all the scenarios where you use this typically. So when I get to a hard enemy or a boss, what I typically do is I buff with Golden Vow, I buff with Blessing's Boon, then I use Seppuku twice on each weapon, once on each weapon, and then I have both blades buffed and then I run in and try and set the hemorrhage status effect as quickly as possible and try and pull off a complete L1 combo. That means L1, 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 L1. This usually maxes out or gets close to maxing out your uh, Winged Sword Insignia and Millicent's Prosthesis because you'll trigger the hemorrhage status effect in that combo. You'll have maximum attack power and because attack power affects spell damage as well, this is the point where you're going to swap one of your weapons off, go to Dragon Communion, and either use Dragon Claw, Bam Bam, or Dragon Ma, and you're going to hit like an absolute freight train when you do it because your attack power is going to be so buff. Your spell damage will be incredibly buff, and you want to hit Bam Bam, and you'll probably take some damage when you do this, which is another reason why we have heavy armor, uh, so you can survive that and good poise, and that will usually finish off an enemy or severely, severely weaken a boss maybe even stagger them where you can go in for a critical hit or just continue attacking with L1 combos if that's better for you and then just repeat this process getting that you know attack buffs from Millicent's Prosthesis and Winged Sword Insignia built up and then switching to your Dragon Claw or Dragon Maw and using them again. This build differentiates a lot from the Dragon Knight build because in that build you were buffing up and then you were just spamming a dragon spell like right at the beginning of the fight often killing a boss or a difficult enemy before they ever got an attack off which is kind of more of a caster setup. This is more of a melee setup that uses some dragon spells like the Blood Dragon build. So if you like the Blood Dragon style of play, that's more you know akin to what you're gonna see here. And we're gonna do another video that kind of emphasizes using the other dragon spells at range at the beginning of fight because that's more of a caster play style. And this is more of a melee hybrid caster play style. When it comes to stats for this build, I have 50 Vigor, 30 Mind, 29 Endurance, 12 Strength, 17 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 25 Faith, and 62 Arcane. 50 Vigor is there to make sure you can trade damage and not die, and also because you're using the Primal Glintstone Blade, you're going to lose some max health, so you want to make sure you compensate for that by having high health to begin with. Our Mind is only 30 for this build, which would seem kind of low for a build that uses primarily Dragon spells, but because we're using the Primal Glintstone Blade, we reduce the cost of those spells significantly, allowing us to get away with lower you know fp pool in order to cast those spells regularly 29 endurance is just enough to use this setup and medium roll if you're using different armor you know you're going to change this slightly i don't like to have any more endurance than i need in order to medium roll in order to spend points elsewhere strength is at 12 because that's what i had for my starting class and dexterity is at 17 for millicent's prosthesis you only need these to be at 11 and 13 in order to use the bandit's curve sword so if you're playing a different class that has these at lower values but other things at higher values you'll actually do better than starting out with a Confessor class. Intelligence is at 9 because we don't need it for this build, and Faith's at 25 in order to use Golden Vow, as well as uh, Blessing Spoon and some of the other Dragon spells because they require that much Faith. And Arcane is basically as high as we can get it here to boost the damage we deal with spells. I did some testing trying to see, like, where's the sweet spot, you know, between Faith and Arcane, trying to see how much Arcane would, you know, outperform Faith in terms of incantation scaling or increasing Faith and lowering Arcane. Basically what I realized, it doesn't matter much. If you crank Arcane and leave Faith at 25, your incantation scaling will be like one or two points lower than if you do some sort of split between the two. And since Arcane will also increase the damage of your weapons and increase the blood buildup, uh, it's just a better stat to have. So don't worry about it. Just don't think about it. Just increase Arcane. So if you're continuing this build forward, you're going to keep increasing Arcane up in order to increase your blood buildup and increase the damage of your dragon incantations. And lastly, if you're using the Flask of Wondrous Physique with this, I recommend using the one that increases your damage the more hits that you do, which is very similar to the, you know, talismans that we use for this build, so that'll further boost your attack power, which will then further boost these spells. And also the Green Burst here, which increases your stamina recovery. I love stamina recovery, it's really good for this build. 
unlike the other, you know, Dragonite build where we use the hidden Ceruleans here in order to just spam a spell at the beginning without consuming FP, because you need to go into combat and, like, get your attack power higher before you switch to a Dragon spell, it's not effective with this build. Stay tuned for more Elden Ring endgame builds. I do have a sequel for the Deathblade planned very soon, as well as some other familiar ones and new builds for those of you out there who are curious to see what else you can do. We'll be right back.